When I was 19 years old, I already had my dream job. When I was in high school, I worked as a draftsman for Eisenbeck Engineering Firm. As soon as I graduated, I applied at Triple S Dynamics and got an awesome job as a draftsman <clears throat> with food processing equipment and building machines for Planters Peanuts and Green Giant and just a wonderful clientele. Kept that for a year while I was in uh, college going at night so I could work during the day and then uh, applied for a, a drafting job with Gardner Denver, worked at that drafting for a few months and then my boss tapped me to be a pen and ink illustrator. <clears throat> Gardner Denver was creating its own art department for advertising, for company magazines, for instruction manuals, and uh, they were gonna have two artists and two illustrators, and I never knew it and never applied for it. My boss saw all my work, put my name in. I got the job, I got a hefty raise, and I was good to go. At 19 years old, almost 20, I was already set for what I wanted to do. Couldn't have handpicked the job better. Brand new 1968 Camaro. A girlfriend I knew I was gonna marry. A neighborhood I already knew I wanted to buy a house in. And then at the end of one semester of college, I decided not to pre-enroll. And in those days, enrolling in college meant your draft number moved way down. Not to pre-enroll means your number moved up <clears throat> and I didn't pre-enroll. I wanted to work. I wanted to keep making money. I wanted to buy a house. When I came home and my father found out that I had not pre-enrolled, he was pretty upset and I threw back in his face one of his own lectures to me. You taught me to trust God. I'm just going to trust God. If God wants me to get drafted, I'll get drafted. If God doesn't want me to get drafted, I won't get drafted. And then one day I came home from work, a job that I absolutely loved. Saw my sister's car parked on the street. That was odd. She didn't live with us. She was married, already gone. Walked in the house. She and my mother were sitting at the dining table. I went to the refrigerator, grabbed a drink, turned around, looked at them. They were still just sitting there. They looked gloomy. And I laughed and I said, what's wrong with y'all? You look like somebody died or I got my draft notice or something. And then my mother started bawling. Indeed, that day when she got home from work, the selective service return address on the envelope, let her know what was probably inside. She never opened my mail, she opened that one. And then she called my sister so she could come over and they could have a cry together and be there together when I came in and they gave me the great news that I had basically 30 days to tell my employer I'm going to the military and uh, wrap up. And so that was it. And so I did. 30 days uh, flew by rather quickly. I couldn't sell my car in that amount of time, didn't want to. I knew my parents wouldn't be able to afford it and keep it, but I just couldn't bring myself to sell my pride and joy. They had to sell it while I was gone. And uh, uh, the company was gracious. Don't worry, we'll hold your job open. You come back from the Army, your job's still there. And so the last night before I was to go report for uh, duty, the induction station in downtown Dallas, my father was going to get up the next morning at 4.30ish, and he and I were going to ride together downtown where he had dropped me off. Just wear the clothes that you have on. That's all you take with you, the letter said. You take nothing else with you. And so that last night, I had to have a date, of course, with my girlfriend and tell her goodbye, a tearful goodbye. And then I came home and my mother had waited up at midnight, of course, for another hug. And I knew she'd still wake up the next morning at 4.30 and she did. So when I finally got into my room that night, uh, mom had, <laughs> my mother had made it spick and span. She had hung, the, I never hung my clothes. She had hung all my clothes up. It was the cleanest, most immaculate my room had ever been. And I walked in that room and my clothes all in the closet where they're supposed to be, the desk chair clean, all the books put back on the shelf. I had built my own corner desk and bookshelves up, double doors on both sides. I was very proud of it. The largest thing I'd ever built at that time. I drew the plans, I built it. My mom had said, that's the prettiest desk I've ever seen. My dad said, and I have to admit it turned out better than I thought. That's the balance I lived with all of my upbringing.
I walked over on this particular night and drug my fingers along the smooth varnish top and thought about the things I'd do differently if I built another one. Walked all the way to the end, the bed over here, the end of the, uh, the, end of the desk, and there was my Bible that always laid there. Sometime around my 17th year, I got really serious about my devotion to God, and I had developed a habit. Every night when it was time to lay down, I would pick up the Bible, read a few verses, and I would meditate on those verses for a moment, try to think of the meaning, how they applied to me, put it back, and then I'd get on my knee, and I would say a good night to God and thank you for the day. It was my routine. <clears throat> and now... Today, tonight, knowing that I'm leaving in the morning, uh, I, I picked the Bible up, I sat on my bed, I read a couple of verses. Can't remember what they were. I'm sure I didn't meditate on them. I put it back on the ledge. And then I knelt for what I knew would be the last time I would kneel at this bed for a long, long time. I didn't know where I was going or what was happening, what my life would be. I just knew that I was going to the army the next day and it'd be a long time before I came back. And so I knelt at my bed in my room that night and I uh, just prayed the way I prayed. My prayers were something like this. Uh, uh, genuinely, I prayed, Lord, thank you for keeping me this day. Thank you for watching over me, keeping me safe. Uh, forgive me of my sins and forgive me of my failures today. Uh, wake me up in the morning and I'll start my day with you I love you. And that's kind of the way I'd pray, just the way I prayed at night when I laid down. This night, I prayed the same thing. It was just a habit, if you please, and I said those things to God. And then, I don't know why, <clears throat> but all of a sudden, it just entered my brain that my routine with God that I'd had for a couple of years would be broken now. I'm going to the Army. I don't know what the Army will be like. And so it's just one of those moments, uh, impulse. I just thought for a moment that's not right. I shouldn't have to end that routine. So I just said to God in my prayer, Lord, I'm going to make a promise to you. <clears throat> my whole time in the Army, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you my word every night, no matter where I am, where I'm living, what it's like, every night I'm going to put my knee on the floor by my bed, my cot, just like I do now. And I'm going to thank you for the day. I'm going to make sure I'm forgiven for my sins. I'm going to promise that tomorrow we're going to start together and do better. I give you my word. I promise. Amen. I got up, laid down, went to bed. <clears throat> In a few hours, uh, the alarm went off. I got up, took a quick shower, met mom and dad in the living room. Mom cried, of course. Dad and I rode almost in silence from Mesquite all the way into downtown Dallas where he let me out on the curb at the uh, induction station. Never even looked over. He was awkward. <clears throat> Hands on the steering wheel. He pulled up, stopped for a minute, reached his hand over, looked straight ahead. <laughs> I kid you not. Just stuck his hand over and said, don't lose your faith. Don't let him take your faith. And I, oh, okay, sir. Uh, okay. And I got out and he drove off and I walked in. <clears throat> and man... Life changed. In a few hours, a whirlwind of things happened in those first few hours. A urine test, blood test, uh, spread the cheeks test, uh, put all your clothes in a box, uh, pick up these clothes. Uh, I weighed 135 pounds when I was uh, drafted at the induction station. That's about how much I weigh from here down now. The bottom half of my body is just about one 35, the, the top half is another, it's just, you know, it's heavy. Uh, these clothes are not the clothes I had in uh, the Army. The boots are. Uh, you get two pair of boots when you, when you head off to the boot camp, and I actually still have one pair of those boots. The, this is a pair that I got in the very first week of uh, my Army life. And then they uh, took us to Love Field Airport, in a bus and put us on an, uh, an airplane and flew us to El Paso, Texas and Fort Bliss. I had never been in an airplane before. I thought this is cool. This is really neat. 
my father couldn't read, so I knew he would never be able to read a letter that I sent home. So I paid a great attention to detail, the way the clouds looked down below the plane, how awesome it was to see uh, terrain from the sky. And I made mental notes so I could write a descriptive letter to mom and she could read it to dad and he would know somehow vicariously what it was like to fly. That, that's, that was what was in my brain. Until we landed in uh, El Paso and got on a bus and drove out to Fort Bliss. And when we got off the bus at Fort Bliss, uh, I realized I was in for a culture shock because the drill sergeants that greeted us were not our mother. They made sure that we knew that. They said that a thousand times with lots of profanity. I'm not your mother. I'm not your mother. You wanted to say back after a while, I get it. I get it. You're not my mom. Uh, it was a culture shock. And uh, so after a while, they uh, take us to a barracks. Uh, there's too many guys for one. I, I don't know. There are probably 100 guys in our barracks and maybe another 100 in another one. There were probably 300 of us all total. And we were there for the early induction and then get assigned to a boot camp company. And uh, so we get our places. We put our duffel bags by the uh, uh, beds that they assign us in a barracks. And then we have to go out and start uh, testing. Uh, the early, the first couple of days are just test. You go back to a big parking lot and you sit there in the sun. And then when they call you, you go in a large warehouse and you color in the multiple choice answer with your pencil so they can scan them on a machine. They do this for a couple of days. And then I notice after a while, the number starts getting smaller and smaller. And then finally, there's just a handful of people going back in. And I was one of four people out of about 300 that they call back in for a final uh, test. And uh, I must have been smart. Uh, not now, so I must have been then. My mother had always told me, whatever you find to do, do it to the best of your ability. And I heard guys around saying, I ain't fooling with this and just writing anything down. I wanted to pass those tests. And so I did as carefully as I could uh, every answer to every test for two days. And then finally, after the tests were all over, they took me upstairs to an office and captains came in instead of the drill sergeants. And they treated me like a prince for four hours. I, I was not yelled at. Nobody told me they weren't my mother. They brought me Cokes and snacks. And they begged me to drop my draft status, join the Army for four years. They were going to put me on a plane, send me to Fort Benning, Georgia, OCS, which is Officer Candidate School. I'd come out a uh, second lieutenant. They gave me all the reasons, showed me a video, tried to explain the perks and the benefits to me. I didn't have anyone I could call because no one in my family had been in the military, so I just didn't know what to do. And finally, after that whole afternoon, four hours, I finally just said, this is my final answer. I'm not going to drop my draft status. I want to serve my time, get out of the Army, go back home, marry my fiance, get my job. I, I want to move on. And they said, okay. They weren't rude. They said, okay. Got up, three or four of them shook my hand. One of them pulled me aside and said, I'm just going to tell you something. One of my questions to them had been, I, what, do you have a guarantee that if I go to OCS, I won't be a lieutenant, second lieutenant in infantry? I don't think I'd want to be in infantry. They couldn't guarantee me where I'd be, just that I'd be a second lieutenant, of course, out of OCS. And uh, so one of the officers pulled me aside and said, look, I don't know where you're going to go, but I'm just going to tell you this. You don't, you, right now, you can stop worrying about where you're going to go because you're not going to infantry. You're not going to be in artillery. You're not going to be in maintenance. You're not going to be a medic. You're going to be military intelligence or somewhere. Uh, I, I can just give you my word on that. Don't worry about where you're going because that's why you're in the office now. We'd like for you to make a career. You're going to be somewhere good. And so I trusted him. And then uh, a couple of months later, uh, they put me on a plane. I'm, I'm in Fort Sam Houston at medic school. I literally went to the uh, medic, uh, the, my commanding officer, and said, I, I, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. And he said, well, that's what everybody said. And so I just settled in for class and did my best. That's the first time that I had settled down and looked back at where I'd been because literally, and you veterans know, it's a whirlwind. The minute you get off that bus, you realize your life is over. It's in somebody else's hand and it's a whirlwind. So what I wanna share with you for the next few minutes is my personal commitment to God superseded everything else I did at 19 years old. 
and uh, much of much of the positive things that happened to me throughout my short military career happened to me because of what happened at my bedside. Remember that promise I told you a while ago I made to God in the last night in the comfort of my home in Mesquite. I knelt and said, God, I, I give you my word. I'm, I'm going to kneel by wherever I am. My first test for that was in Fort Bliss, the very first night after a day long of testing. And then we come back to those barracks. And now I'm telling you, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know it was going to be this way. There's a hundred men in there. There's a long row of beds here and then a walkway there and a long row of beds in the middle and then another long row of beds butted against them and then a walkway and another long row. There were a hundred men in that barrack. Fluorescent lights, it was bright. No dividers, no privacy. Beds are four feet apart. And uh, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. It's late at night already. I wanna lay down. I get my clothes off, I get ready. I sit down on my cot and I turn to lay back. And then I remember, uh-oh, I made a promise to God. I can't tell you how much I regretted in that moment making that promise. I wished I had not made it. I sat there, I looked at this brightly lit barracks, fluorescent lights everywhere. I can't even describe the cacophony of sounds that were just prevalent. It, everyone was talking, yelling, cursing, swearing, mocking, mocking the drill sergeants, making fun of the way one of them talked, talking about how sorry the military was, how stupid they were for getting drafted, talking about just nonstop. Vulgarity was just everywhere. It's like everybody was trying to prove they're tougher than everybody else. Everybody had an ax to grind. There was no just sit down, hey, how are you? Where are you from? Although we did ask that, we were drowned out by the belligerent sounds of angry men feeling cheated and, and, and just terrible. And I promised God I would put my knee on the floor by my bed and I, I don't know when the lights are going out. I thought, don't they have lights out? It was 11 o'clock, the lights were still on finally. And so finally, I, I gritted my teeth. I, I, I knew, I, I rationalized, God won't hold me to it. God knows it was something I just made in haste. He won't force me to do this. He's not going to punish me if I don't. I didn't want to kneel. I was afraid. There were guys, I was four feet from men sitting right there and another guy sitting there and guys sitting behind me. Everybody's talking and yelling all through that place. And every, they're right there. Their knees are sticking out here. If I turn and kneel, my backside may bump one of their legs. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't do this right here now. And in my mind, I'm just saying, God, you, you understand. I made that in haste. But there's just something about a commitment and a promise. And I, I just, man, I, I will not. It, it's not that God wouldn't forgive me. It's that I wouldn't forgive myself. I had started in my last year of high school. I started a little habit. I just kind of got to where I would tape scriptures here and there that I thought would help build my character. And then I wanted, I developed this attitude of every morning when I get up and look in the mirror uh, to get ready to go to school or work, I want to I want to look at myself in the mirror and say, today, this is the kind of boy or man, this is the kind of man I want to be. And, and I did that intentionally and on purpose so that when I got ready to go to bed at night and I go in the bathroom and shave or whatever, you know, uh, soft whiskers in those days, I didn't have to shave most of the time. And, but, but when I got ready for bed, I want to be able to look in the mirror and say, today's been a good day. You have been the kind of man that you want to be. And then there were days I failed, a lot of days, and that's when I would get down after looking in the mirror and not liking the person I was, and I would say, God, forgive me today. Forgive me for my sins, the, the messes I made, the failure I had. I'm going to try harder tomorrow. Wake me up in the morning. We'll start together. I'll try harder. That was my habit. Now I've made this promise. And so finally, I just thought, hey, you know what? I can't, I can't lay here all night long waiting on the lights to go off in privacy. And, I, oh, man, I imagine. Your imagination is such a crazy thing. I imagine that men were going to mock me, say things out loud, be, be silly. I didn't know. Throw boots at me. And so finally, I just rolled over my, and, and slipped down by my cot, and I just quietly said my prayer. 
I was aware that it got quiet right here. The guys just quit. I didn't pray out loud for them to hear anything I said. I whispered my common prayer to God, thanks for keeping me today and forgive me for anything I've done wrong and, and help me tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a better day. And that's it. Jesus name amen I got up I wouldn't look up at him I just turned around and laid down in a few moments the banner and the chatter was up but I just learned the first lesson I had just learned the first lesson that I would learn in my next couple of years and I learned it at the cot so I'm going to share seven lessons that I learned at the cot and the first one is commitment takes courage if you're going to commit to anything in life it's going to take courage to commit to it and it may surprise you to know you have more courage than you think you do. It took courage to finally put my knee on the floor and then nothing happened. It just got quiet. Nobody asked me the next day, what'd you do that for? Nobody made fun of me to my face. They might have by me. I don't know. Didn't care. It's amazing how much easier it got the next night to just hit my knee. And by a few nights, everybody just expected it. They didn't even slow down talking. They just kept yakking. I knelt, I prayed, I got up. I had a conversation with them, laid down. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to tell you that if you ever make a commitment to anything, if you commit to marriage, if you commit to love, if you commit to your faith in God, and you commit to your relationship with God, anytime you commit to anything, it's going to take a lot of courage to live up to it. Nobility, character, a lot of courage. The good thing is... You already have it. You just have to take the first step. If you take the first step toward right character, love, faith, you'll be surprised how strong you really are. God never asked us to do anything we couldn't do. He never asked us to do anything we're not capable of. So you have the courage, and it takes a lot of courage to make that commitment. Now, I have been sent to med school and I've been kneeling by the bunk all this time. Guys have come uh, to know that. They've come to accept it. Made some friends along the way. No real problem. Everything's okay. And I, I tell my CO, I think I'm in the wrong place. He laughs. Everybody says that. I said, no, really. An officer told me in El Paso that I was not going to be a medic. And and uh, the, the commanding officer just laughed. He said, ah, you're just yanking your chain. Two weeks later, two weeks later, the uh, back door opens. PFC Carpenter is yelled at the back. I turn, a runner is back there with papers in his hand. He said, you're in the wrong place. I got orders to take you out of here. My commanding officer had to come down. What's going on? They pulled me out of medical school, put me across the street in a holding barracks because they didn't know where I was going. I just wasn't supposed to be there. That was the way it was for me for the next four AITs. They didn't really know what I was doing or where I was going. They sent me from there to Fort Polk, Louisiana, and I was just in an admin school, a clerk school. And then from there, they sent me to Fort Ben Harrison, and I was in finance school and learned all about military finance. And then while there, since it's a, all four uh, military branches are there, Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force all have to train at Fort Ben Harrison. Uh, while I was there, they sent me to an intelligence school, and I got to learn all about passwords and clearances and all those kind of things. And, uh, and so uh, it's interesting and intriguing, and I'm thinking, this is good. I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky. I'm being trained well for something. And then all the orders start trickling down from my buddies, and so, you know, they don't all come at once. And guys are called out of formation at 5 o'clock in the morning. You're going to Germany. You're going to Alaska. You're going to Guam. You're going to Germany. You're going to Germany. And, and everybody's getting orders for these exotic places. And then, uh, and then comes uh, my day. And they they call my name and and it's uh, and it's 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 Vietnam, and uh, and so I was one of three in my entire company that went to Vietnam, and literally the other two guys volunteered to go. I'm the only person out of my entire training company that did not volunteer to go to Vietnam. They got sent to Vietnam, and so I'm telling you that when I was uh, ready to kneel down by my uh, cot that night, uh, I didn't want to kneel down. The night that my orders came from Vietnam, I felt betrayed by God, and I'm sitting there on my cot at night, and I didn't want to kneel down. I was uh, uh, afraid to go. I was afraid of what was coming. I didn't understand why I was the only one to go. 
And so I uh, decided that night not to kneel by my cot. I was going to kneel, but not there. I needed to be able to pour my soul out to God, and I couldn't do it comfortably there. The barracks that I was in in Fort Ben Harrison literally had an empty second floor, had all the cots in there, but it was empty, nobody living on it. So I went up the stairwell to the second floor, and it was cold outside, a little snow was falling, had a little radiator by a window and, and a little bed there by it. And I found a place I could kneel close enough to get a little bit of warmth. And that's where I knelt. And while I, when I knelt there, I just poured everything out. I just, I'm just telling God, I don't know why I got, I don't know why this happened. I don't know why you did this. I, I feel like you've forgotten where I am. I, I thought everything was going so good. I don't understand. Um, I mean, like really and truly, th this is just, this is just crazy. You, you, you and and I, I don't know how to explain it. But in that moment, in that moment of fear and angst and and worry, wasn't an audible voice. Absolutely no audible voice came. But just an, an assurance came to me that was not just like, hey, feel better. I literally felt like in that moment, God said, don't worry about anything. I got it all in control. Everything I'm doing has a purpose. You're going to preach one day. And you're going to be a pastor one day. I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating, not lying. Kneeling by that cot on an empty second floor in Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana, I felt like God said, I have a purpose for you and a plan for you, and you're going to be a pastor. And I, I wasn't a pastor. I wasn't a preacher. I wasn't a preacher's kid. I knew nothing about pastoring and preaching. And so I literally jaw dropped like, God. And I learned a great lesson that night at the cot. And the lesson is very simple. When you confide in God, I needed that second floor empty so that I could talk longer than just beside my bed. I wanted to pour things out. I poured things out. I wasn't there for 10 minutes. I was there for an hour. I laid it out on that bed. I, I kept explaining to God, I feel such, I feel so betrayed. I feel like, man, I thought everything was clicking so well. I'm, and, and then now I'm the only guy. And then comes this tremendous feeling of God just saying, everything I'm doing has a purpose. I have a purpose for you and you're going to pastor. And I wouldn't dare tell anybody. I never told a soul about that for about two years. About two years later, when I was safely home and traveling around the country, literally being asked to just preach, not a preacher, just being asked to preach in churches, uh, I finally broke down and told a pastor what had happened to me in that barracks. And he didn't try to analyze it. He just said, well, we used to call that a calling. <laughs> and so that was it. But I have to tell you that that night that was so hard for me was not just hard because I felt cheated as the only guy that went. I had been reassured by my mom, my dad. My dad was a praying man, and he had prayed that I was not going to get orders to Vietnam. My mom let me know, son, we've told the church, the whole church is praying that you are not going to go to Vietnam. Well, man, I had a praying dad and a praying mom and a praying church and a praying sisters and praying family. I mean, I just, and if they're praying and they're telling everybody I'm not going, I'm probably not going. And then, then that night, that day came that I got the orders and, and then I prayed that night and felt like God said, hey, I got a purpose and a plan for you. He confided in me that everything was right and like it's supposed to be. And I still didn't want to go. Well, I don't know anybody that would want to go. And so I don't mind telling you that even though I had that assurance, strange thing that God just said, I got a purpose and a plan, you're going to be a pastor. I had that assurance. I still, I, I can be a pastor without going to Vietnam. Why am I going? Family had been praying, church been praying. I know what it is. It's a test of my faith. God's just going to see how long I'll hold and maintain my faith in him. And and here's how my my now now a 20 year old brain here's how my brain is thinking i bet when i get on that plane and land in oakland i bet they'll say i bet they'll say uh we got wrong orders for you because they've been doing that everywhere i've been and then i thought uh 
when they didn't do that in Oakland, I thought our next stop was Alaska on the way to Vietnam. I bet when I landed Alaska, somebody will meet me there and say, man, you got the wrong orders because they've been doing that. They did that at every AIT. And nobody stopped me at Alaska. And then we landed at Guam and nobody came up at Guam. And even then, I'm still thinking when I landed, when I landed at Saigon, somebody's going to come up and say, we got the wrong orders for you. You're going back. But they didn't. And, and then I was pretty much in Vietnam and, uh, and assigned to uh, 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 a cot and a tent, literally. And so I'm telling you, I learned this valuable lesson my first night in Vietnam when I put my knee on the ground because I was literally in a tent on the ground on a cot just like this, wooden frame cot just like this. And I put my knee on the ground the first night and I realized that night in that prayer, that prayer doesn't mean you're going to get your way. Prayer means you will accept whatever God's way is. It's a lifelong and valuable lesson for me. There are many prayers I've prayed that have never come to pass, but I long ago quit blaming God and fussing at God because I learned by the cot that the purpose of prayer is not to make God do everything I want. The purpose of prayer is to ask for what I want and then be big enough to accept what he gives me because he always knows best. So prayer is not a guarantee that it's going to work out your way. Prayer is the strength you get to help you accept his plan. When I got to Coochie and they put me on, they gave me this card, I put it together. And uh, they, they didn't have a place for me. A commanding officer literally came to me. This is the way it had been for my whole army uh, experience. A commanding officer came to me. I am now in Coochie, Vietnam. And he comes to me and he says, I don't have orders for you. I mean, I got orders. You're here, but I don't know why. And I said, well, well what is your company? He said, well, I'm over finance, but I've got all the finance guys I need and I'm not losing anybody. I'm not sure why you're here, but my order for you say you're coming and I'm supposed to just hold you until further notice. And he showed me the orders, printed orders for me. And he said, the unfortunate thing for you and one other guy, one guy, not in the same company. The unfortunate thing for y'all is we don't have a place for you to sleep. Uh, all the hooches are full and uh, we don't have anybody leaving. So you're going to have to sleep out here. We're going to find you a tent somewhere down at maintenance and put it up. So they came back later with a green army tent, big enough for about four or six cots, but there's only two of us. And so we put that tent up and then he and I just sleep on a cot just like this. And a foot locker they finally brought down the, at, the, at the end of the first week. But for the first little while, the duffel bag and the cot was all I had. And uh, the other guy that was in there, we didn't know each other. We were strangers, so we got acquainted. And then it was the same routine. You know, that first night I put my knee on the ground and realized I didn't get what I wanted, but I'm going to accept God's will. And then I laid down. Around 2 o'clock in the morning on that first night, uh, artillery started booming out. I didn't know it was artillery. All I heard was explosions. And uh, so I'm awake at 2 o'clock. He's awake at 2 o'clock. He said, what do you think that is? I said, I have no idea. And then we started hearing different sounds. We could tell when it was pointing away from us and when it was pointing maybe over our heads. And then we'd hear different sounds, pops of different sorts and in the next couple of weeks, he and I would learn to distinguish between mortar rounds coming into our camp and hitting our camp from outside and our artillery shooting out, uh, sending supporting fire to uh, the fellows out in the field. We would learn the difference in the sound. But I've got to tell you, after I woke up at 2 o'clock that first night, I was terrified, and so was he. We didn't have any sandbags around our little tent. All the hooches had 55-gallon uh, drums filled with dirt, piled with sandbags on top. It would take a direct hit on a hooch uh, for a mortar. would have to hit directly for it to uh, kill anybody inside. If it hit just outside those barrels, everybody inside is safe. Not in those first two weeks, but later on, catty corner from my hooch would take a direct hit, 
a couple of guys would die, burn the hooch completely out, and, and uh, have to be torn down and uh, redisperse the guys. But now we're sleeping, and we know we can look around and realize all the hooches have dirt around them for protection. We got nothing. We're just in the middle of a field in a tent, and we have no sandbag and no protection. I, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that my duffel bag was literally packed full of everything you have. And so I literally took my duffel bag and laid it on my cot, and then I laid next to my duffel bag because I thought at least one side of me is protected. If mortar hits over there somewhere, I'll have a little bit of protection from my duffel bag. And so I pulled it up and slept with it the next few nights. Terrifying at night to hear sounds you've never heard before, to hear nonstop explosions from sometimes around one o'clock till four o'clock in the morning. No sleep, weary. And uh, so finally after about the third night or so, uh, every night I'd knelt by my cot, my buddy over there never asked a question. I never volunteered. And, and a few nights into the booming and the noise, I still think at this point, I'm never going home. It was such a shock to hear and to experience the ground reverberating and, and fires here and there. And so I just thought, I'm never going home. And a, a terrifying thing, in spite of the training you've already had, it's real now, it's real bullets, it's real shrapnel. And I, I knelt on a few nights, a third night or so by the cot. And uh, I, 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 you know, there's no more bravado. There's no more thank you for a good day today because it's been a horrible day. And so a few nights into that tent and by that cot, I just poured my soul out. I just gave it to God. I cried a little bit. I said, I don't think I'm going to make it home, God. I, I, I really am. I really am. I'm, I'm just afraid. This, this is crazy. This is the craziest war. This is the craziest country. This is the craziest system. Nobody knows what's going on. And uh, I know good and well this duffel bag won't keep anything from going through it. I'm, I'm a goner. Uh, just, uh, you know. And so that's the way I talked to God. I cried and prayed a little bit. And finally laid down by my duffel bag and learned the next lesson that I learned. And that is, <laughs> if you pray when you're afraid, you'll sleep better. I've done that a few times over the years, but then I lost fear a long time ago. Not much I'm afraid of anymore, period, life of any kind. But uh, there were a few times in those years, and even when I came back and traveled around the country, there were a few times I slept in some bad places and wasn't sure about my environment, but I discovered always, if I just stop, confide to God, pour it out to Him, let Him know I'm afraid, God brings a great calm and a great peace. He said he would. He said, my peace I give you, not like the world gives, peace that passes all understanding. I found that peace through prayer. And so that was my, my Vietnam experience was uh, a pretty good after that. After a couple of weeks, they got me a place in a company and, and it was sure enough, it was an experimental kind of thing the army hadn't done before. And uh, just me and four other guys were the first guys to get to try a completely new uh, thing uh, and it was uh, unique. I don't even know how to describe it. I, I I did a little bit of intel. I did a little bit of finance. I literally only had officers. I had 200. Uh, aver I averaged 250 officers that I just took care of. They were my guys. I even had some generals. I took care of them. When I say I took care of them, I mean I I paid them. I took care of the problems they had back home. I made their uh, I paid some of their uh, bills for them. If their kid, if their 16-year-old son had a wreck back home, you, you got to understand what the Army was trying to do. We didn't have cell phones, computers. We had no communication. Our communication was seven to ten days just for a letter we write to get there, and then seven to ten days for a letter to get back. And so officers got a little exemption. If I had an officer who had a crisis and his kid had a car wreck and broke both legs, they want the officer to know they don't want him to go out in the field and, and have a trauma at home. So I would be able to fill out a form on a rotating drum. I don't know what they're called. Fill it out, put it on the drum. The machine spins it. It's actually sending it back to America and to uh, 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 Indianapolis. And then they get all the data and all the insurance information and all the stuff. And they send it back to me. And I would get my response on the same day. And then I would be able to go take that information to my officers so that my officers in charge of the guys 
wouldn't have uh, depression and wouldn't have panic attacks and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a unique thing. I, I don't know if they still do that or not. Probably not. It was an experimental. We knew we were the first to actually have that kind of charge to it. I'd go get a helicopter, fly out, find my generals or find my colonels, my captains, and then let him know where we were, what, what, what I had done to solve his problems and fix all those things. And so that was pretty cool for them. But for me, I didn't get to use that thing. For me, I just had to write a letter and wait 10 days, and then 10 days later, I get a response. And that was all right until I started knowing something was wrong with my fiance. Those letters weren't quite the same as they used to be. When I got to Vietnam, they'd arrive with the smell of cologne on them. And then they got to where they didn't arrive very often. I could tell by my mother's letter something was wrong. I asked, had to wait 20 days to get a response to it, 14 days if you're lucky. That was terrible. And so the absence of mail was really a troubling thing. And uh, I just, when I knew something was wrong, uh, a, a friend in that church, a, a, a man, I got a letter from a man, and he said, nobody knows. I'm sending this to you. Please keep it confidential. But I want you to know what's going on. I feel like you're not getting the whole story. And so he told me what was happening. And it was stuff you'd expect, you know. We, we should have never got engaged before I went to Vietnam. That was unfair to her. Uh, but we did, and it was, not, it was unrealistic to expect her to just sit there and hope I'd survive and come back home. And I have no grudges to bear about any of that stuff. But at that moment then, it was terrible to try to communicate with a 20, a 14 to 20 day lag was just impossible. And so one day, uh, you know, I went to mail call. Mail call was huge. I went to mail call every day. And it would be, uh, a mail call was just this. A clerk from the mail department would just come to the a boardwalk at the end of your company, your compound, and he'd just yell out, mail call! And then he'd just pull the letters out. Boil! Snow! Mazerno! You got two! Mmm, smelled like perfume. That, that's the way mail call. And, uh, and I would go, I, I had a letter every other day almost for a long time, and then all of a sudden, there's no carpenter call, no carpenter, no carpenter. One a week without mail. Like, well, I guess it's finally happened. I'd send a letter off knowing, hey, nobody's going to answer it for 14 to 20 days, but I'll send it anyway. Never a response. And so I went for a long time. I went, uh, my, my, uh, one of my relatives, one of my family members wrote a letter, said, you know, it sounded like you were blaming mom and dad. Don't do that. Oh, okay, I wasn't. I'm asking them. Very frustrating. And so I can't explain to you how frustrating it was. I, I'm just telling you, it was, it was a, a terrible experience. And then finally, one day, I'm so anxious. I quit going. I just sat at the uh, hooch and waited. And one day, it's like, snow, Mazerno, boil, carpenter. Man, I jumped. I ran. I got, I got a letter. Got the letter. <clears throat> it was that letter. It's the one that I would nail on the Dear John board in our company the next day and I'd have to read it out loud to everybody. But that's all right. I knew it was coming. It was just horrible to wait all that time on it. And that night after that experience, I had to do what I always did and my promise to God and I got on my knee beside the cot. And I started talking to God about how helpless I felt and all of that. And I learned the good lesson about God. If you pray, that's all you have to do. Just pray. God works everything out. He'll give you favor. That's all. If you pray, God will give you favor. That's simple. So I, I say that because I'm praying that night, and I'm like, God, this is so horrible. You know, my life is over. I'm not going to get married when I go home. I'm not going to buy that house. I don't even know if I'm going to make it home. I don't. My family's bad. It's all been disintegrated. They're not even going to church there anymore, and it's just terrible. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm on my knee in self pity. And then God starts reminding me one night, and He starts just go the names. One of the boys came, calling my name, looking for carpenter, carpenter, carpenter. I'm down here. Come talk to me. Okay. He's about to have a nervous breakdown. We weren't even great friends. 
He knew I was a Christian. He knew I prayed. The boys must have talked about it behind my back. He came looking for me because he thought he was having a nervous breakdown. He was panicking. He was going to the shrink. He'd screwed his life up. He had messed up with a prostitute on camp. He didn't know what to do. We were able to sit down and talk, and I led him to Christ and helped him find forgiveness for his sins and hope for his future. And then he reminds me of another one and then another one, and I'm on my knee feeling self-pity, and I realize, what do I have? I'm feeling bad because mail brought me bad news, but I'm sitting here in a war zone with a, a record of men who have sought me out, and I don't even know why, but they came to Carpenter. He did, he did, he did, he did. I had no enemies in Vietnam. All I had was respect and favor and men who would come to me when they couldn't take what else was going on in their life. So in one night, I apologized to God for letting bad news from home steal the moment that I was in where I realized I've got God's favor all over my life. And while I'm engaging in that with God, I pick up on this second, this other lesson from God, isn't that here? Hey, you're whining about the letters that have taken two weeks to get back or longer. How long does it take me to respond when you pray? Oh, that's instant, God. That's instant. That's fast. God's mail is not dependent on television and news and internet or any of those other things. God's mail had always been instant for me. And so I wish I could close this by saying that was it for me. I knew that any time I drop a knee, I'm instantly in touch with God. I have even preached sermons along that theme over the years. Uh, one I call the mailbox, one of my favorite sermons over the years because I thought of the mailbox system. We put our checks and our bills in a mailbox on the side of the road, and then we just lift a little red flag, and we don't think about it. We don't care. We don't count how many mail people pick it up, uh, how, many people, how many trucks does it ride on, how many planes does it fly on. We don't think. We don't care. We write a check to the IRS, put it in the mailbox, lift the red flag, and the system takes over, and it gets to where it's supposed to go, and the bill's paid. And God reminded me that that's his kind of mail. I, I just send it to God in prayer. I just get on my knee by my cot and say, God, please take care of this. And that's lifting the red flag. I get up and go my way, and it's already being, I don't know how many angels he has to employ. I don't know how it gets from here to there. I just know it's not a slow truck or a slow plane. God is not limited to anything. And all he waits on from us is prayer. Just pray and lift the red flag, and the system that God has built takes over. And I wish I could say that that was the end of it for me. That, that day when I got that, that letter and knew my life was changed, my family's life was changed, I wish I could say that was it, but it wasn't. I had one more episode where I got, relo I got relocated to another camp, and we turned our camp over to the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And so we convoyed to a little uh, small base on top of a hill called Camp Jones. And, uh, and uh, I only had a few months left, three months left in the country. And, uh, and, and I didn't have a lot to challenge me by that time. And by that time, I'm the old guy, not the young guy. The rookies are coming in scared. I'm one of the old seasoned veterans now. And so my duties were limited. My commanding officer didn't ask me to do a lot. And, uh, and I have plenty of time to think. And the more I thought, the more I worried, and then I realized uh, nothing's going to be right when I go home. Nothing is going to be right. Everything I had planned and thought when I go home, nothing's going to be right. I won't have the same, I won't have anything. My, my parents have, have left that church. The, my, my friends have left there. My family has divided over some of these issues. I, I, don't, I don't get letters from them anymore. I don't send letters anymore. I hadn't gotten letters in well over a month and a half, two months. And I just thought, okay, that's it, I'm done. Life is never the same. I literally reached a place where I thought I, I might as well not even be careful here. If I die here, so what? 
And uh, so I, I genuinely reached the lowest state of depression, I guess probably I've ever been in my life. And one day I just got up and decided I'm done. And my commanding officer saw me leaving my duty post and he said, where are you going, Carp? And I said, I, I don't know, I'm going to find something. And uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was going to find peace, but I didn't really mean that. I was just going. So I, I walked. I didn't know where I was going. I walked to the gate. I was going to try to just catch a ride and go out the gate and go somewhere. Just go. Just, just go. Get off somewhere. Whatever happens, happens. And nobody was, no trucks were going out. And I couldn't hitch a ride and go anywhere. And I didn't really want to. I just went there because I was depressed and ready for it to all be over. And, uh, and, I, and I walked down to uh, a couple of the other buildings that I knew might be empty. And just, just not knowing what to do, I walked over right, right to the behind the bunkers. And right there is our five wires, our concertina wire, and our Claymore mines. And I just walked out there. You, you don't ever just walk out there. You stay hunkered down. You stay behind the walls. And I just walked out. And I, I just don't care. I, I don't, it, it doesn't matter if I live or I die. And uh, so finally, I just, I, I didn't know what to do. I went back to my hooch, and, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm totally gone. And I, I, I don't want to pray, but it's the posture that I'm most comfortable with, and I don't know what else to do. So I just knelt down, and I just, I just laid across it. Never said a word. I just laid across it for a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean maybe a half hour. I just laid there. Couldn't, couldn't take it, couldn't doze off, wasn't tired. My mind was racing 100 miles an hour with depression, no point in going home. I don't even know if I do make it home, I don't even know if I'll go back to Texas. I may just stay in California. Don't know what I'm gonna do. Life is over. And finally, after a while, just not knowing what else to do, in my familiar posture, I just raised up with my eyes closed and just held a hand up like I sometimes did in prayer. Now, right next to my cot was a plywood partition that we just strung up between two befores to give us a little bit of privacy. And so I'm by the plywood partition and I, I throw my hand up like this. And in that moment, one of, my, uh, one of my friends, one of my nutty friends, with no respect for what I was feeling or going through, reached over that plywood partition and got a hold of my hand and squeezed it. And I flushed with embarrassment and anger. I thought, why would he do this? He, he must know I'm trying to pray. But I squeeze back and you know, you're careful when everybody's got weapons of some kind, you, you just don't, you know, you, you're careful. And so I squeeze back and, and then I thought for a minute, what can I say to this nut? And I literally kind of counted to 10, you know, to handle the moment and then I thought, here's what I'll say. I'll, I'll just look up and say, you nutbag, what's wrong with you? Why are you so stupid or something like that? He squeezed again, I squeezed, and now I've got my composure, so I'm ready, and I raise to see which of my knuckleheads have looked over that wall. And there's no hand. There literally is nothing there. It has squeezed me twice. I have squeezed it back, and now there's nothing there. And I'm, I am a goose pimple now with like, what in the world? And in that moment, a voice echoed through my brain and the voice simply said, if you'll just keep holding on to this hand, I'll take care of everything back home and everything will be all right. And that was it. And I fell across the bed after that and I wept like a baby for the first time in a couple of months. And I literally wept, and that brings me to the final lesson that I've learned at the cots in my military experience, and that was simply that if you're broken, he will never throw you away. If you are broken for any reason, he will never throw you away. If you're broken for the second time, it's not your first time to be broken, it doesn't matter, he'll never throw you away. If you're broken for the ump, Tenth time, you just can't seem to get it right, and you're still broken after you promised you wouldn't be, he still won't ever throw you away. There is never a time that God will throw you away and say, I'm done with you. Bruised, bruised reed, smoking flax, he doesn't break it, he doesn't throw it away, discard it. He never throws you away. And so, for whatever 
purpose I offer this to you. I hope it has some meaning and some value in your life, and especially this. I close this by just saying to you watching, if you uh, feel broken tonight or if you're broken at any time in the future, if you feel like life isn't the way it was supposed to be, life didn't turn out the way it was, marriage, finances, faith, anything in your life that has taken you down a wrong path and you feel like you're a broken man or a broken woman. I wish I could urgently tell you that there's nothing you could have done and you couldn't have done it so many times that you would ever reach a place where you said to God, please forgive me and put me back together. And God would say, no, I'm not going to do it. All he's waiting on is for you to simply put your knee on the floor and you don't even have to put it on the floor. I'm just telling you, my lesson from the cot is he's waiting on your prayer. He just wants you to pray and give it to him. And the very hand that I felt that night, I've never let go of. He's never let go of me. And I can tell you, he worked it all out back home. I wouldn't change my life for anything. I wouldn't be anywhere other than I am now because I finally realized God was in control of it, had a purpose and a plan, and I surrendered it to him. If you're broken for the first time or for the hundredth time, this is a good time right now to just say, I'm going to take it to God, and I'm going to let his hand get hold of mine. I think it'd be good and a good time to just bow and, and bow for prayer. Put it in your words, prayer. Give it to God and wait for his hand to guide you and take you. Let's pray.